us, at some point in our lives, are faced with some decisions which we don't really ever understand quite the implications of the decisions we reach. There's two times in my life in the recent past when this has happened. I spent the first 18 years of my life traveling around the world, the son of the youngest of six and the son of an English teacher. I moved to the UK when I was a teenager, learned how to speak with a British accent, <laughs> learned English reserve, trained in medicine and then trained in neurology. And at, at the, coming towards the end of my neurology training, I was giving a talk, not dissimilar to this and not in a dissimilar audience. And about this time, about 30 seconds into the talk, I looked up at the audience and I thought to myself, I don't want to work with you lot for the rest of my life. <laughs> Apologies to neurologists in the audience. I went back to Oxford where I was finishing my PhD and by chance the opportunity came to go to live in Vietnam. Without really thinking about it or the consequences, I moved in the end of 1995, beginning of 96. I thought I'd go for a year or two as an adventure and come back to run a migraine clinic in Edinburgh. I stayed 18 years. The next major event in my life was in February 2003 when SARS came to Vietnam and my life and my professional life changed forevermore. A very good friend of mine who was working for the World Health Organization in Hanoi was worried. A person had flown from Hong Kong to Hanoi and whilst in Hanoi had got very sick and was admitted to the hospital where my friend Carlo Abani was working. The patient, despite the best efforts of all the doctors and nurses, got much, much sicker over the course of the next few hours and days. And Carlo noticed something else. A lot of the doctors and nurses who looked after that patient got sick. Carlo, working in great partnership and trust with the Vietnamese authorities, made an incredibly brave decision and showed phenomenal leadership. He effectively quarantined that hospital and prevented people coming in and coming out. And as a result, saved a country from what would have been a terrible SARS epidemic. And he also alerted the world to the coming of SARS. Carlo stayed in that hospital and looked after that patient. And a few weeks later, tragically, lost his life, along with a number of colleagues and friends from that hospital. It was a dramatic moment. SARS lasted about six months. It spread to 40 countries. It infected about 8,000 people, 800 of whom died. The World Bank estimated that those six short months cost about $60 billion. And at the end of SARS, there was a sigh of relief and the world moved on. But then a few short months later, it felt as if things came back. It was Vietnamese Tet. I know Thanksgiving is big in the United States, but Tet is really big. Tet is a wonderful celebration. It's a time to be with family and with friends. It's a time to be on holiday. But for some really stupid reason, I was working in the hospital that night. And I got a phone call from a very, very dear friend and wonderful colleague, Professor Hien. He was seeing a young girl in another hospital in another part of the city. And he was worried. The girl had a pet duck. And tragically, the pet duck, the love of her life, died. She buried it. And then she had a big argument with her brother and she dug that duck up again, cuddled, cuddled it one last time and then reburied it. A few days later, she got very sick and came to hospital with a very, very severe lung infection, which progressed very, very quickly. Working over that Vietnamese holiday, we had no idea if this was the recurrence of SARS, the memory of Carlo Urbani was close in all of our minds, or whether this was something completely new. All of us working in global health remember our history in 1918, when 40 million people died of flu. 40 million people, that is twice the number of people who died in the whole of the First World War. 40 million people when the world's population was only 2 billion or less. Or was this something new, something we had never heard of, something we had no knowledge of? Working through that Vietnamese holiday, 
terrified of going home because you never knew what you might take home with you, we were able to show that this was not the recurrence of SARS. This was a novel influenza virus which had presumably jumped across from her pet duck into this young girl. Miraculously, that young girl got better and went home. But over the course of the coming weeks and months, we saw many, many patients who came in with very severe and very aggressive lung infections across Vietnam, in Indonesia, across Southeast Asia, and indeed in Egypt. Over 60% of them died. And we were left, I was left, with a real sense of helplessness. Through SARS and through bird flu, we really were not sure of what we were facing. I remember being in a meeting of all of the doctors and nurses across Ho Chi Minh City, comparing notes about this new avian influenza outbreak. We were talking about the patients and what might happen. And suddenly, in the corner, somebody coughed. <coughs> and the room went silent. It was a very terrifying time. It was the most frightening time of my life. And in the intervening decade since that, we've faced in the world a number of epidemics, some of which you'll have heard of, swine flu of 2009, and some you may not have done. There's a virus circulating in the Middle East at the moment which comes from camels and which can affect humans and which can pass from one person to another. It's been circulating for four or five years now. We have no drug, we have no vaccine. And then, of course, there was Ebola and there was Zika. And we are facing a changing world. The environment is changing. The relationship between human beings and the natural world is changing. Human-animal interactions are changing all of the time. And urbanization is driving the 21st century. And global travel is allowing that to spread around the world, not in weeks, but in hours. And that is the world we face today. It seems very unusual, it seems counterintuitive to look at Ebola and look for some sense of hope and optimism. But in fact, in Ebola, we learnt for the first time, we relearned some very, very harsh lessons. The first phase of that epidemic was an absolute disaster. The three countries, Sierra Leone, Guinea and Liberia, did not know what was happening. They had not the capacity to know that Ebola was spreading within their communities. And the world was far too slow to respond. Apart from Médecins Sans Frontières, we were all far too slow. But the second phase of the epidemic, the world changed. And we relearned the lessons that health systems and strong and resilient, robust health systems around the world are absolutely crucial, both to the national health of those countries, but also to all of our health. They are essential to the global health security, and we must do everything we can to support those communities. We also learned the importance of surveillance. And this modern world with smartphones and technology the ability to identify things and share that information with colleagues, friends and countries is absolutely fundamental to saving lives. The Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea was out of control, but Nigeria was forewarned by that sharing of information. And as a result, it was able to control the epidemic before it could take off. We also learnt the gaps we have in our knowledge. If you look at SARS, if you look at MERS, if you look at Ebola, we had no drugs and we have no vaccines. Imagine going to a clinic with your child or your family and a doctor or a nurse telling you, I'm sorry, we have no treatment for you. We have no vaccine. It's unthinkable, but that's what's happened in all of these epidemics. And at the end of each epidemic, we've moved on and we have forgotten. But I believe that this time will be different. During that Ebola epidemic, an amazing global coalition came together, hosted and led from West Africa, but with the benefit of the advance of the National Institutes of Health, Centre for Disease Control, Médecins Sans Frontières, the French, the Norwegians, the British, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and many others. 
And we were able to demonstrate when we were bold enough that even in the height of that panic, we were able to show that a vaccine for Ebola works. That is a phenomenal achievement. Never before during the course of an epidemic have we been able to show that. The power of science and the power of innovation and the power of the ability to lead and make bold decisions transformed an epidemic. And that was an absolutely crucial lesson. So as we go forward and we think of the future, we should remember that although there are cynics out there that think, say things are not possible, actually, when we really have the courage to try, we can change the world. I was a young doctor at the start of the HIV epidemic. I saw many, many people die because we had no treatment for them. And yet, when we invested in science and we invested in people, we were able to bring antiretroviral drugs to the world and we transformed what was a death sentence into a manageable condition. We've been too slow to spread that access around the world, but we are getting there, and that is real progress. Over the last decade, by investing in science and bringing science into society, we've transformed malaria with the development of superb drugs for malaria and bed nets 700 million people have not had malaria in the last decade because of the power of science. Three and a half million people are alive today because of those drugs and because of those bed nets. The power of science to transform all our lives is absolutely phenomenal. We are on the edge of eradicating polio. There were many, many people who said an Ebola vaccine, HIV, malaria, polio, we will never be able to control these. And yet, in each of one of those, when we've dreamed, we've been able to deliver those dreams into reality. And although I've been personally terrified, frightened to go home in the evening for fear of what I might take with me, remembering the lesson from Carlo Urbani, that very, very dear friend, I also know that I've never been more optimistic of our ability to change the world. And I believe we've never had a better opportunity than we have today. And if we grasp that moment, we can make the world a better place for everybody. And I believe the lessons from SARS, from bird flu, from Ebola, if we grasp the moment and bring the best of all of our science to bear, we can truly transform the world. And we must not let the cynics and the doomsayers who say to us these are not possible, because they are all possible. And at a time when societies and politics may be taking us in a direction of narrow nationalism and isolationism, where we look inward, not outward, I think it's ever, ever more critical that civic society those of us who truly believe that the world is now a very, very small place. And what happens in Kinshasa will, happen, will affect what happens in Kansas. We should remember that SARS devastated Toronto, and Ebola came to London, and it came to Dallas. Zika has spread from Central and South America and is now in Florida. What happens in any part of the world will affect all of us. But if we have the courage to grasp the moment, to realize that if we bring the full force of all our wit, our skills, and our expertise to bear, we can truly change the world. And I believe that if we have the courage to dream, and if we have the courage to commit ourselves to investing in people, in the greatest ideas, in science, and then realizing all of that exists within the culture that we work in and the society that supports us. I believe that we can make the world a safer place wherever you come from in any part of the world. And that's the opportunity that we must grasp. And it's there. And finally, I'd like to pay tribute to that dear friend, Carlo Urbani, 
and I'd like to pay tribute to all of the healthcare workers around the world who are working tonight in often extraordinarily difficult circumstances, in clinics and hospitals, putting their lives on the line, in areas of conflict, at risk of being bombed or shot, or on the edge of emerging infections. In doing so, they serve their patients, they serve their community, but they serve all of us. And I'd like to pay tribute to them, to healthcare workers all over the world who are making you and me just that little bit safer. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to all of those people around the world and thank them. Thank you.